very happy to meet many of my old friends again today and to see some new friends. I hope you enjoyed Hope's show, slideshow on light and sound. Light and sound, vision and audition, seeing and hearing are the most important experiences of human beings. There is nothing more important than seeing and hearing. When we see and hear, we believe. Whatever we see and hear, we believe. If we see but do not hear, we do not fully believe. If we hear but do not see, we do not fully believe. But when we see and hear, we believe. So strong is the effect of these two perceptions, seeing and hearing, that they govern our entire belief system. We would believe nothing if these two faculties of consciousness were not available to us. Therefore, it is but natural to be moved by something that we can see and something that we can hear. We have other sense perceptions too. We can touch, we can taste, we can smell. But once we start using those three sense perceptions, we begin to confine ourselves to a material, physical world. And we get testimony of the reality of a physical world through these five sense perceptions combined. When we cross-check an experience of ours, by reference to the experience we can have with the other sense perceptions, we get validity of that experience. If I see this wire in my hand, I will not believe that this is a real wire. It could be an illusion, could be a three-dimensional projection. If I could hear the movement of the wire, I would still perhaps say, let me touch it and see. When I touch it, I say, it is real. I am using one of these five sense organs to test the validity of the other experiences. And that has been the fatal blow these sense perceptions have dealt upon human beings in trying to understand the truth. Because in trying to understand the truth, we relied upon sense perceptions which deceived us by making us believe that whatever we could perceive with sense perceptions must be real. And that is why we said this world is real because we can touch it, taste it, smell it, in addition to seeing it and listening to it. The sense perceptions created the illusion of reality. Let us consider the experience of going to sleep and in the sleep having a dream. And in the dream, a strange awareness comes to us. Is this a dream or is it real? Are we sleeping and merely experiencing a projection of the mind, which we call a dream, or is it real? And we go about in the dream world, touching things, tasting them, smelling them, seeing them, hearing them, and saying it's real. It looks real. The same system which makes this world real, makes our dreams real. And we continue to believe the dream to be real while we are relying upon these sense perceptions till we wake up. When we wake up, the entire reality of the dream is gone because we found a fatal error in trying to discover the truth, trying to discover reality. The fatal error being we were cross-checking the same reality with one sense perception as against another at the same level of consciousness. It did not occur to us that if the level of consciousness is the same, how can use of one or more organs of perception change that reality? If what we can see, we can also hear, it does not make it more real. It only means we are able to perceive it through more than one sense perception. 
if we can use all five sense perceptions to see, hear, touch, taste, and smell the experiences around us, we take those experiences as real till we wake up. Therefore, if somebody who has real awareness of the dream state and the wakeful state is asked this question, what is the true test of whether your experience is real or illusion? His answer would be, the true test would be, if you wake up, you should find that you were the creator of that experience. If the experience is independent of you, it must be real. But if you wake up and you find that the people you saw, the things you saw, the world you saw has disappeared along with your dream and in your wakeful state, you can recall parts of that experience, you know it was a dream, it wasn't real. But can you say that before waking up? It is not possible to truly find the nature of a dream except when we wake up. Therefore, cross-reference to other perceptions of senses is not a reliable method for making an inquiry into the nature of reality or the nature of truth. The proper approach would be, is this the only level of consciousness that I can experience? Or is there a way of having a level of conscious experience which is more wakeful than the one I am having now? If one can wake up to a higher level of consciousness, then one is in a position to judge whether the first experience was real or unreal. When I speak sometimes about the experiences of those who have woken up to higher levels of consciousness, this question is frequently put to me, how are you sure that what you describe as a higher level of consciousness is not merely a flight of fancy, a flight of imagination into a dream world. You talk of non-gravity existence, light bodies, bodies emitting lights, a world which does not require an external light source to be visible. You talk of telepathy as a normal means of communication. Are you sure these things are real? And you are not just making them up by suggestion, by reading too many books on this kind of literature? How do you know it is not your suggestion? It is real. I have no real answer to that question, except to put a counter question. I asked those people who put this question to me, do you go to sleep every night? And they said, of course we do. Everybody does. And I said, do you ever dream at night? They say, yes, we do. And I said, when you wake up in the morning, are you sure you are awake? He said, of course, there's no question about it. He said, what proof do you have that you are awake every morning? When you open your eyes, do you pinch your body? Do you call somebody, tell me, am I awake? Has anybody done that? When we wake in the morning, we know for certain, without any other testimony, that we are awake. We also know for certain, without any other testimony, that what happened earlier was only a dream and was not real. We also know without any further in investigation that there is a big difference between the reality of the wakeful state and the fantasy we saw as a dream. Though only a little while ago, the dream looked as real as the wakeful state. The very fact of being awake brings into our consciousness the state in which we were before we went to sleep. A person wakes up in the morning and people around him say, you are still sleeping. You are dreaming. He'll believe no one. He'll believe his experience, that he's awake. Not the experience of opening his eyes and seeing the wakeful world. Not his experience of listening out and seeing if this is the same world. Not his experience of touching anything to say if it is the wakeful state. Not his experience of smelling and tasting the world to say he's awake. When a person wakes up in the morning in bed, the eyes are still closed. The position on the bed is identical as you went to sleep and the person knows one is awake without pinching oneself, without looking at anything, without opening the eyes. What happens? What happens to consciousness that it gives such a certainty of knowledge 
that there is no question about that you are awake. What is that experience? And every one of us have it every morning. It is not a unique experience mystics are having. It is an experience you cannot shut down. It comes to you every morning. When you wake up without any testimony, without proof, without argument, you know you are awake. What kind of experience is that? The answer is very simple. The answer is, you know you are awake because you remember you went to sleep. The link between a state of being in which you were before you slept comes back into memory and that makes you awake. Supposing a person forgets. If a person wakes up in the morning and forgets that he went to sleep, he will never know he's awake. He will mix up the dream sequence with the wakeful sequence and never know which is real, which is unreal. Therefore, the truth of the matter is that we are so certain that we are awake now because we remember that we were in the same state yesterday before we went to sleep. It is the recollection of the previous state of being, the previous experience of being, the previous episodes, the very last moment when we went to bed and went to sleep. It is the recollection of that, mo that moment of previous wakefulness that gives us a total certain validity to the experience of wakefulness now. If we apply the same test to a higher state of wakefulness, then it should happen that by waking up to a higher level, we should be able to remember that we were there already. That what we thought was the wakeful state was an interposition of experiences very similar to the wakeful state, but not the wakeful state. Having many features common to the wakeful state, but not the wakeful state. Having many connections and relationships with the wakeful state, but not the wakeful state. For consider, when we go to sleep and dream, how do those dreams come about anyway? Do you know there is a connection between those dreams and the wakeful state? If I cannot have my wish fulfilled here, but the wish is there in the wakeful state, I go to sleep, I have it fulfilled in the dream. The dream sequence is being created by something that happened in the wakeful state. I frequently take an example saying if a strong guy came and hit me, like Bob sitting in front of me, a strong guy, muscular, and he gets mad at me and he comes and hits me. I see that he's a strong guy. I can't hit him back. But I keep this in my consciousness. I try to forget it, but I can't forget it. I go to sleep at night. In the dream, I again see him and I am much stronger in the dream, so I hit him back. When I have a dream of hitting him back, it is not accidental. It is a reaction to what happened in the wakeful state. Therefore, dreams don't come about just like that. The dream pattern is being formed by experiences that occurred prior to the dream. They may have occurred in the wakeful state, they may have occurred in the previous dream or in the dream prior to that. Thus was the hypothesis of reincarnation, karma and paying off for what we did in the past and getting rewarded for what we did in the past come about. Because we could explain the dreams through past experiences we felt if there was a higher wakeful state when we die and leave this physical body, maybe the experiences of this physical world, which we think is the wakeful physical state, may be based upon what happens when we are not in this body. When can we find out if this is true? Is there a direct way of finding out if this is true, that there is such a thing as a real law of karma, if there is such a thing as a real cause and effect relationship in what is happening to us now, if there is a real way of finding that out, it must be to wake up and recall. Like the best way to find out why we have a particular dream is to wake up and find out. So the question comes down to a simple, very real issue. Is there a higher wakeful state? And can we get into that at will? Well, let's get back to the dream sequence again. 
when we are sleeping and having a dream, can we wake up at will? The answer is no. We wake up when we wake up. We wake up when the sleep is complete. Similarly, the answer here is, can we really wake to a higher state? The answer is no. We wake to a higher state when we die. We wake to a higher state when this body has lived its life. But if we just wake up at the time when we die, how can we find out the truth of these statements? If somebody wants to wake up in the middle of his sleep, he can do it. But he needs some help. A person who goes to sleep and says, wake me up. I want to find out what happens if I am woken up in the middle of my sleep. He can do it. How? He can tell a guy who is awake and is not sleeping to nudge him on the side in the middle of his sleep. When the person who is already awake nudges a person who is sleeping, the person who is sleeping wakes up because of that nudging. It may happen that when the person who is sleeping and who wants to be woken up in the middle of his sleep, when the nudging takes place, he may be having a dream. In his dream, he might be wandering around into Shaky's ye old pizza shop and eating pizza at that time. So when the nudging takes place, he's eating pizza. He'll start saying, let me finish my pizza. The friend is saying, wake up. Man, you told me to get, wake you up. Wake up. He says, let me finish my pizza. He says it so loudly that the sleeping body in which he's lying down in bed is saying, for these, in, in sleep talking, let me finish my pizza. But he is not feeling that he's sleeping and saying, he's feeling he's in Shaky's pizza parlor. When he says that, the person who is awake may say, come on, I'll hold your pizza for you. Come wake up, I'll give it to you. And this friend wakes up. After he wakes up, will he question that friend? You told me you were holding my pizza. Where is that pizza? Will he accuse that friend? You told me lies. Just because I was sleeping, you told me lies that you will hold my pizza and give it to me. No. The moment he wakes up, he will know the friend participated in his dream and spoke about the pizza with the sole purpose of waking him up, not to protect the pizza. Such is our state. If there is a higher wakeful state, higher than where we are now, if there is a state of wakefulness better than the physical wakefulness we are experiencing now, the easy method I can think of of having an interruption in the slumber is to let somebody who is awake nudge us. And if such a being is around, we won't see him because we have closed our real eyes and opened up the dream eyes. But when he speaks to us, he will participate in our dream. He will come to us as if he is part of the dream. And he will talk to us of things which we are experiencing in this dream. And he will give a sense of security to us about things which we are experiencing here. Not because he is taking these things as real, but by, because by giving security of things that we are experiencing here, it enables us to wake up to a higher level. Such persons who are awake in relation to us we in the East call them mystics. We call them the enlightened ones. We call them those who have already attained a level of consciousness higher than ours. When those persons come into our life, they enable us to wake to a higher level of consciousness in the middle of the sleep, in the middle of this experience, physical experience. And thereby, we get a complete direct proof of the validity of the statements they make about higher levels of consciousness and higher states of wakefulness. There is no way of having conclusive evidence of a higher state of being and a higher state of wakefulness except by waking up to that state. The rest is all conversation, discussion, words. But actual waking to that higher state is the only conclusive evidence we can have that there is such a state. The beauty of this whole episode is that this ability to wake up is available to us when we are human. Every human being 
irrespective of caste, color, creed, nationality, location, age, has the ability to wake up. It is not confined to any select group. It is open to everybody. A small child of four years can do it. An old man of 100 years can do it. Anybody in between. From what I have said, it looks like the responsibility of nudging lies on somebody who is already awake. What can we do about it? We have forgotten if we set up a timetable, an alarm system. We have forgotten if we had a real friend whom we requested. In the middle of our sleep, wake us up. We don't remember. We are in the middle of this physical dream state. What do we do now? Is there something we can do in order either to recall that we had requested a friend to wake us up or to give some indication to the friend that we want to wake up? Can we be restless and toss and turn in the bed in which we are sleeping? So that if there is a friend around, he can nudge us and say, now you were really restless, you didn't want to sleep anymore. Maybe you were having nightmares. It's good time to get up. So many of us in the physical life that we lead here have created nightmare experiences for ourselves. Wouldn't we like to wake up? What can we do? Is there something we can do? The answer these enlightened ones have given to us from time immemorial. Ever since they set foot upon this planet, ever since they have talked about this subject, ever since there is any record of these things, the answer they have given is, as human beings, you have the ability to seek. When you seek, you find. This ability of seeking as a human being is different from seeking instinctively on a program. What makes us a seeker? If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door shall open. What makes you so unique to be able to seek and to be able to knock, to be able to find? What makes a human being a seeker of his own true status? What makes a human being a seeker of his wakeful state? What is the special characteristic which only human beings have and nothing else in creation has? Neither the animals, nor the fish, nor the fowl, nor the nature, nor particles, nor electrons, nor angels, nor gods. None of them has got one. Only human beings. What is that special quality which human beings alone have which make them seekers? That special feature which makes us seekers is the experience of free will. Only a human being can say, shall I or shall I not? Should I or should I not? May I or may I not? This question of exercising an option to go this way or that way is not available to any other part of creation except a human being. This is the experience of free will. It is this experience of free will that makes a human being a seeker. Because then it looks like there is a choice to seek or not to seek. When you feel you have a choice, you become a seeker. The choice may be real or unreal is of no consequence because we do not know. If somebody told me that the decision you made after so much thought was already recorded in a book kept in a special chamber in a higher level of consciousness called the Akashic Records and you spent so much time thinking about it and making up your mind and then you came to the very conclusion that was recorded already as you will make. It will still make no difference and will still make me a seeker. Because I have been through the experience of seeking. I have been through the experience of feeling I had options, I had choices, I made my choice. Therefore, my experience will show that I did not follow the Akashic records, the records report, reported what I did. This experience of free will is what makes human beings unique. Because in the entire creation, as reported to us by the enlightened ones. There is no one else except the creator who set up the whole show, who had the free will to set up what he liked, and a human being who thinks he can decide what he likes. What about angels and gods and people at higher levels of consciousness? Why can't they do it? They can't do it because they can see the future. 
if we could see the future, we would find we have no free will. If we could see our entire life in advance, we would find what are we fretting and fuming about? What we will decide is already decided. We would have no experience of free will. It is the ignorance of a human being that gives him the experience of free will. It is the knowledge of the creator that gives him free will. The difference is very subtle and very small. The difference is the creator has set up the pattern, made the choices out of knowledge what he is doing. He knows the whole thing, the whole pattern. And we, the human beings, are made in the image of the creator. And the main qualification that makes us close to the image of that creator is the ability to make choices again. But our choices look like choices because of our ignorance. We don't know what the choice is. We don't know what we have already decided. Therefore, it looks like we are making choices now. This feeling of free will, this illusion of free will is responsible for making human beings seekers. And when they seek, they find. Therefore, what can we do to interrupt the dream sequence we call wakefulness and find a higher level of wakefulness, a higher level of consciousness which makes this world look like a dream? What can we do? We can seek. And the more intense our seeking, the more restless we are in the higher world and therefore more quickly we are awakened. Therefore, what is needed is very simple, an intensity of seeking. Does study of books help too much? Not really too much. Because it can divert us from seeking. People who read too many books, they get diverted from seeking. Because seeking to be intense must be so concentrated that you have time for nothing else. The books take us into the intellectual fold. Takes us into an intellectual pasture where we like to draw lines, make diagrams, where we like to analyze things, like to place things in classification. The human mind operating through the intellectual process is very fond of analysis. It will analyze anything you give it. It will analyze to such a point, it will forget what it is analyzing. You can try. Give something to the human mind and keep on working on it with the human mind. After a while, you will find the human mind doesn't know why you started work at all in the first place. The analysis, the classification, so long as you can say there are three parts of this, you are fine. There used to be a professor in India. He excelled in this art of dividing everything into three parts. I heard him speak in big conferences. I heard him delivering commencement addresses in universities. And I never heard him miss this element. There are three ways of doing this. Then he would go. Sometimes he wouldn't even remember what the three ways are, but he would still start with three ways. Once I heard him making the astounding statement, there are three ways of looking at light. There is first the light. Secondly, there is a non-light. And thirdly, there is something that is neither light nor non-light. Even that, such a statement was accepted by people, accepted by the human mind because of the classification, the analysis. The human mind would like to analyze everything. Analysis means break up. Did you know that? You cannot analyze anything without breaking it up. The more you analyze, the more you break it up. When you break up, you don't see. Take a beautiful painting on the wall. You see the beauty in the painting. Cut it into pieces with a scissors, pair of scissors, into small pieces, one inch squares. Heap them on a table and see the pieces over and over again. You never see the beauty. The painting is still there. Nothing has happened to the painting except you have cut it out into small pieces. If we want to see the reality of light, the reality of consciousness, the reality of how we are experiencing life, the reality of what we can experience, what are beyond these physical limitations, and we start cutting it up, we'll never find out. Intellect, therefore, by its very nature of relying so heavily upon analysis, places a limitation upon itself and cannot investigate truth. The more we get into the intellectual process, the less we know about the truth. Ultimately, the intellect becomes a burden upon us. It sets grooves for us. When we go through an intellectual process, 
what is logical becomes groovy for us. I don't know if the word is correct, groovy. <laughs> but actually it does turn us groovy. Because the intellectual logic which we have once seen, ah, that makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because it is logical. That becomes a groove. It's very difficult to get out of it. Our openness, our ability to see truth as it comes is lost in the process of adopting a groove because it was logical. Truth may not be logical at all. Why do we presume that truth must be logical? When we examine truth, when we examine experience around us, again and again, we come to the conclusion, it is not logical. The mind wants things to be logical. The mind will accept only that truth which is logical. The moment it is not logical, it will throw it away. No, that's not acceptable. It's not logical. doesn't make sense. There are some things happening to us which are never logical. Let me recount some of them for you. Intuition. The intuitive hunch, the sudden flash of knowing something that comes is totally illogical. The very reason we call it intuitive is because it is illogical. If it was logical, we would not call it intuition. We would call it an intellectual process of reasoning. Reasoning differs from intuition because intuitive knowledge is irrational. It's not reasonable. It's not reasoned. But we know it's real. We have all had that experience of a sudden knowing. We know it's true. Somebody says, how do you know? I don't know how. How did you come to know? I don't know how I came to know. When did you come to know? I don't even know that. But I know it. I know it's true. What happens to that kind of knowing? Because it is illogical, because it does not follow the laws of cause and effect, therefore the mind quickly takes over and rejects it and throws it out and conducts our life in the logical process, not even relying on the knowledge that we got intuitively. We throw intuitive knowledge into the waste paper basket, into the garbage can, merely because it is not logical. Let me give you another example. The experience of love. Love as an experience of such concern for somebody else, of so much awareness of somebody else that you forget yourself. Not love as an ego trip. I love you, not that kind. The love in which I is forgotten because of the insistence of you in your awareness. When love comes, it comes so suddenly. It's not planned. There's no rationality behind it. It's illogical. When the experience of love comes, it's illogical. What do we do with it? We reject it. The mind quickly takes over and puts all the questions which are logical. Is it real? Are you sure? Do you have any doubt about it? Maybe it's not real. There it is. The love is thrown into the garbage can. Take the third example. Experience of beauty. When you experience something beautiful and joyful, it's an illogical experience. There's no intellectual basis for that. Now try and reason. I looked out of my window and I saw such a beautiful sight in the morning. And then I put my mind to work and say, why was it beautiful? Was it because of the skyline, because of the trees, because of the buildings? The beauty is lost in the process of analysis. I have lost it before I knew it. Therefore, we are having constantly experiences in consciousness as part of human experiences, which are being rejected by us merely because of our over-reliance upon the intellect and upon the logical process. Are we not doing a disservice to ourselves? Which part of us gets intuition, love, beauty, joy? And which part of us gets reasoning, sense perceptions, logical sequences? Did you know there are two parts? Did you know there are two distinct parts? in human consciousness, but they are knotted up so closely, they look like the same. One part is called the human mind. I'm using Eastern terminology. You can call it intellect. One part is called the human mind or the intellectual mind. The other part is called the human soul or the spirit. The human mind is responsible for logic, sense perceptions, 
and all activities of consciousness in time and space. The human soul is responsible for love, intuition, joy, beauty, all experiences out of time and space. Did you notice that even for the smallest sense perception, you need time? Just to see something, just to hear something, just to touch something, to taste something, to smell something, you need time? You cannot do any of these things without time? Did you also notice that you need space? That if time and space was not there, you could do none of these things? Did you notice that to have a thought, you need time? Even the smallest thought? Did you know that to have a logical sequence, you need time? Did you know that there can be no logic without time and space? Did you know to accept perceptions in time and space and to accept logic and thought and reasoning in time and space, you need cause and effect relationship? Did you know if you cannot connect cause and effect, all these are thrown out as of no, as of no consequence? Did you know that the human mind cannot perform except in time, space, causation framework? Take this framework away, the human mind fails. Ever observed it? Sense perceptions, logic, reasoning, thinking, these cannot take place except in a framework of time, space and causation. Take this framework away, the mental faculties finish. And did you know that the spiritual functions of a human being, which come from the soul, love, intuition, beauty, joy, do not need this space. Time, space, causation framework. Did you know when you have the experience of intuition, it takes no time at all? Not even a billionth part of a nanosecond. It was not there and then it is there. There is no time sequence that you take to get intuition. Did you know the experience of love has never taken place in time? It just occurs without time. Did you know the experience of beauty and aesthetics is timeless? Look at your own experiences in this physical world and you will find the distinction between the mind and the soul. But they are so knotted up together. They are tied up so closely together. We don't distinguish between them. Somebody says, I want to speak with my soul. And he closes his eyes and still speaks with the mind. Somebody says, I have heard a message in my spirit. And he listens to the sounds of words in his head and thinks that's the message on the spirit. It's all mind. Why is it mind? Because it takes time. Whatever takes time must be mind. Therefore, when we use language for communication, there is no way except to use mind. Therefore, language is a great barrier to discovery of truth. I am speaking to you in words, in language. And I am confessing that this mode of communication is itself a barrier to discovery of truth. If we want to really discover truth, we must find some kind of a language that does not use words, certainly not the spoken and written words. That language which can transmit truth must be a language that is unspoken, unwritten. What is love? It's a language. It's not spoken and not written. The moment you speak, it becomes a mental language. People pray. They pray in language. When they speak, when their prayer is not yet spoken, it's a true prayer. When they speak out, it becomes a mental letter addressed to the Lord. And when they wait for an answer, it does not remain a prayer, it becomes correspondence. Therefore, the true communication is beyond language. And the reason is very simple. Language consists of words which are merely phonetic sound symbols of experiences we have had. And we use those phonetic symbols to relate to those experiences. And then we use those phonetic symbols thinking others are also understanding the same experiences. It doesn't even occur to us that the experience we individually have had with every word we use in our language is different, unique and separate from the experience anybody else has had with the same words. I take a simple example. A child grows up and is taught the word chair. The first chair the child will see and we call it chair 
the child thinks that's the chair. If it's a big chair with a high back, the child's mind accepts chair as a big thing with a high back. If that child were not to see any other chair and speak as a grown-up to another person who's only seen small chairs, he say, I have a chair, he'll mean the high back, without using any other word. The other person will think this child is speaking about a low chair. Other person has never seen the high chair. The word chair does not convey anything except the sound of this word chair, what it meant to one person and what it meant to another person. When we repeat the words and associate it with more than one chair, the definition becomes larger and larger. But the truth remains, there are no two people who have seen the same chairs. Therefore, no two people can refer to the same experience by using the word chair. It's not possible. But this is a simple example I am taking of chair. Take example of things like love, jealousy, abstract notions, God, creation, consciousness, higher consciousness. When you come to such words, they mean totally different things to different people. And yet we think we have communicated very well because we use these words. The words made a logical sense to the speaker, so he presumes it is making logical sense to the listener. In the sense in which he is speaking. The listener is listening to the words and creates his own logic and thinks this is what the speaker is saying and the two are apart. Therefore, language is a very poor medium if you want to communicate truth. Truth is a, is a communication without language, without the mental apparatus of analysis. Truth comes when we are ready for it without language. When we can share an experience in an identity of Oneness, truth can be experienced. Supposing two flames want to communicate and they join together and become one flame, they have truly communicated. Because the experience of the flame is the same, identical. There is no communication required. One flame does not have to tell the other flame how it burns, how bright it is. When the two become one, communication is established. So is it true with the human spirit, with consciousness? If consciousness has to communicate, it must be one. There is only one experience that I am familiar with which makes this unison of consciousness possible in the physical world. There is only one experience that makes the experience of oneness real and that is the experience of love. Love is the only experience in this world that can put you so much into the identity of the person you love that you become that person. Every other experience keeps you apart. Now when I say love in this context, again I must remind you, I am talking of love and not attachment. Because attachments also are called love in this world. And we speak this truth every day. Oneness, ultimately there is only oneness. As you rise higher, you discover oneness. Nobody bothers to question, are we going into a state of loneliness? Because oneness must mean loneliness. You can't help it. What happens if the truth is oneness? Then the truth of loneliness must also be real. And if consciousness eventually, ultimately, in its primordial form, in its real form, is oneness, it must be lonely. If it is lonely, it must create company for itself. If it must create company without there being anything else real, it must create illusion. If it must create illusion, it must create an illusion that looks like real. If it must create illusion that looks like real, it will create something like what we have now. It explains creation. This world and any levels of creation can be explained by the very truth of the spirit being lonely in a state of oneness. And there is nothing that can be experienced here which gives us that oneness except love. So what do we do when we are in the mental state using our minds for communication? Instead of love, we start experiencing attachments. And attachments we want to call love. In attachment, we speak in the following order. I love you. Have you heard this phrase? I believe every one of you. Is there anybody here who hasn't heard this phrase, I love you? Everybody here has heard that phrase. And everybody 
thought it's a great phrase. It's a great statement. I love you. Go and look into the head, the consciousness of the person who says, I love you. 99% time you will find in his mind, the process going on is, I love you. The three things. I, the ego, is experiencing something called love with a person called you. Who is most important in this relationship? I. Next, love. And last of all, you. If you want to test what I am saying, you respond to that person by saying, but I don't love you. In a few minutes, he will say, then I hate you too. Because the paramount force that prompted him to say, I love you, was I, ego. You will notice that these ego trips, which are based upon the mental functioning of a division, you and I, and something between us called love, this mental activity, which we call attachment, this attachment is being dubbed as love. Let me remind you, togetherness is not love. Togetherness is attachment. Oneness is love. And oneness is different from togetherness. Because in togetherness, you are still separate. However close you might be. In oneness, there is no I. You've forgotten who I was. You've forgotten who is the lover. You've forgotten love. You only know the beloved, the one you love. This total concern, identification with the object of love is called love. The rest is attachment. But when attachments take place, the mind takes over and creates doubt, suspicion, and breakup. When the spirit surrenders the mind, surrenders the ego, and has an experience of oneness, identification with the beloved, there is no breakup. The experience of oneness. This experience of oneness, while we are separate, is only possible through love. Therefore, true communication without language is possible only with that identification which we call love. But what happens to people? These enlightened ones come and tell us there is no way an enlightened person can use except love. People are sometimes deeply interested in the Eastern mysticism, Eastern methods of self-realization, Eastern methods of God-realization. So many people from this country go to the East to study the subject. So many people buy books written in the East. So many books starting from the Vedas have been translated into languages of the West. So people should know how did they find out the truth? What was their methodology? I was asked once to write a chapter for a book on Eastern mystic methodology. How the Eastern mystics found their methods of realizing the higher truths. I had to very bluntly tell the author of that book that if you want me to contribute a chapter, it will have to be a very small chapter. And he said, how small? Just a few pages? I said, they have to be very small pages. He said, you mean it can fit into one page? I said, it can. It will have to be a very small page. He said, you mean just a few sentences? It will have to be very few sentences. You mean to suggest you can put the whole of Eastern mystic methodology into one sentence? I said, I could, but it will have to be a very short sentence. <laughs> he said, you mean just a few words? I said, they will have to be very few. You mean just in a few words? How many? I said, one. Love. There is only one word that represents the entire chapter on Eastern mystic methodology. There is no other method that has ever been used by any Eastern mystic. Because there is no other way of communicating. We can go into analysis. We can go into a very beautiful, satisfying tonic for the mind. We can have intellectual discussions and keep ourselves absorbed for life. It doesn't give us any insight into truth. It does not give us the wakeful experience. It does not tell us what is in store for us in higher consciousness. It makes us experts in words. It does not tell us what is real. Love is the only experience which makes us truly awake to a higher level of consciousness because that is true communication. Therefore, the Eastern mystics, when we come in contact with them, they may say many things. That is like telling us that they will hold the pizza for us. The object is not to do that. The object is to generate that oneness 
which makes us awakened to our own higher reality.